Greetings, everyone, and welcome to R. Kelly Appeal TV, where we discuss the topics of Robert Sylvester Kelly and the Chicago trial, as well as the federal Brooklyn trial um, and appeal. So welcome. Thank you so much for coming on today. I give a nice shout out to all of my subscribers and all of my potential energies that come forth continuously on all the videos that I share and give their point of view. You know, um, I don't want to name one or two. I want to just give a shout out to everyone so I don't leave anyone out. So today is September the 2nd and I wanted to fill you in on something, a conversation that I think we should discuss here at R. Kelly Appeal TV. I feel that it is very vital and it is the conversation that we had um, on August 31st with CBS Chicago, the case against R. Kelly. R. Kelly State, Def State Defense Attorney Steve Greenberg's perspective on the federal trial. Now, you know, he's going to continue to be Robert's attorney when, once everything is cleared on the federal level and then it hits the state but he has a lot of things that he has to say, and I want to get your point of view about it. So let's get started on it. Probably have a commercial. So, yeah, we do. But um, I just really and truly, I want to let everyone know that this is a great time. Robert has, you know, done his part. He's just waiting on everything else to come to fruition. So here we go. And hello, I'm Brad Edwards. Thank you for joining us here on CBS in Chicago. The stream. On Tuesday, the prosecution rested their case against disgraced R&B star R. Kelly. After presenting two weeks of evidence to prove the singer enticed underage girls for sex and even produced child pornography, court proceedings resume Thursday when the defense's first witnesses take the stand. Here to talk about where the case stands, what we can expect from here, is a defense attorney, one of our friends of the stream, Steve Greenberg. Steve, uh, it is a note here, you also have and currently are still representing R. Kelly uh, involving the, the state case here that is still pending, uh, have repped him since 2018. You're keeping a, a close eye on this one. Uh, the first two weeks, of course, uh, the U.S. attorney and uh, the federal government laid out a pretty, pretty damning case. What are, are your thoughts on it so far? Well, I don't think the case has gone as uh, well as the federal government assumed it would go. You know, there's a couple of different components to this case. There's the uh, manufacture or production of child pornography, which involves three videotapes. There's a fourth videotape, but it doesn't exists they haven't been able to produce it they haven't been able to find it um on those what are your thoughts about that not being able to find a video that were supposed to persuade the society the the mass media they promised to deliver something that they did not deliver um what are your thoughts to produce young lady on the videotape came to court and said that's me on the videotape so those charges against uh, r kelly are are troubling and and probably he probably won't be able to overcome those but then there's the other aspects there's the obstruction of justice um counts some of them deal with preventing witnesses from cooperating in the earlier state court prosecution and we not being able to to deal with the fact that the the videos are there what are your points of view there's two questions i want to ask that today if you were the jury would you find robert sylvester kelly guilty or not guilty off of exactly what was presented you know everything that was on the prosecutor side that was presented what the stories were and all that it's like a 
this is better than the guiding light or what's the other one with uh oh god i forgot all the people's names so far the young and the restless you know so what are your points of view about if you were a jury a juror on the jury would you believe the prosecution's stories number one and number two if robert should robert have already been a been charged for the two what would it would it have been better for robert to have been charged in 2008 instead of waiting until 2022 if they were going to do it anyway would this be a separate situation the obstruction would it have still come out in 2022 even if he had have served his time in 2008 what are your thoughts about that With those, I think the government's witnesses were not so good. Uh, they didn't come forward and say, hey, they paid me to not do this. Uh, in fact, they said that, well, we were friends. He was my godfather. He took care of me because he loved me. And then there's some other counts involving some other minors. And again, the witnesses on those counts, I don't think were very convincing. Uh, based on the tweets that I read in the, in the newspaper articles. Um, sort of what the government found out here is that the people that were involved in this case were not their normal white collar witnesses. And when anytime I think the feds get involved in. Now, what do you think Stephen Greenberg means by white collar witnesses? You have what is known as blue collar crime and white collar crime. The blue collar crime are the crimes that is committed within, uh, work settings, work, uh, warehouse settings. Maybe people are stealing pallets and pallets of items and then selling them, kind of like the water commissioner from whatever state that was. And then you have people who are white collar where they're stealing and embezzling millions from the top of organizations or they are, you know, attorneys who are misleading client base in order to receive, you know, more compensation. He's, he's working overtime, but yet yeah, he's really not. So white collar crime is, is more federal where blue collar crime is more state. And of course, you know, uh, regular crime is just local and, um, so, or, or state it hits state as well. But what are you, what are your thoughts on what he's saying about that? that these women and these witnesses were not credible to the degree that they knew what was really going on inside of the whole mirage of the quote enterprise that was all about people manipulating and playing and finding ways to use Robert's money for their own selfish gain. What are your thoughts about that? Okay was more akin to street cop crime or 26 in California stuff, uh, sometimes the witnesses get beat up a bit more than they thought they were. There you go. Defense is now going to come in and uh, he's got some dog defense attorneys. There you go. He just said it. You have these people that are backyard roughnecks trying to run and create something for this multimillionaire. So believe me, you, these thug life people, they have ways of maneuvering and surviving as someone's t um, communicated with me, surviving. So when you're trying to survive, $500,000 is way much more than you would even think of trying to survive on. So there was something bigger. And there were people who were manipulating the situation in order to get these people to even invest in the whole concept of this future obstruction charge that was, the seed was planted in 1994, 95, 96, 97, and 98. What are your thoughts? attorneys in the federal case, R. Kelly does. How do you overcome 
what, by all accounts, is the, the damning video evidence that some say clearly shows an R. Kelly having sex with clearly underage girls. How, how do you even begin to overcome that in defense of him? I, I don't know, quite frankly, that they can, and I don't know that they're really going to uh, try to do that. Um, I think that it has always been somewhat uh, conceded that the jury was going to see this video, and, and I don't know that anyone's taking the position that it's not R. Kelly. In the state prosecution, in the 2008 trial, uh, the quality of the video that was used was not as good as the quality of the video that they're using in this case. Back then, it was much harder to tell that it was R. Kelly, and the uh, young lady in the video did not come forward and say, that's me in the video. In fact, she had given statements saying it wasn't her in the video. Now she says she lied back then. It is her in the video. Her mother also came to court and said it's her in the video. So, I, you know, sometimes. And now that draws us back to that whole backyard roughneck. These people knew what they were doing. They knew. Um, okay, well, I'm just going to go ahead. There's something I'm getting that's going to keep my mouth shut. There's something I'm getting that's going to keep me from being able to have to, you know, tell on you right now. Not knowing that in the background, they were going to end up telling on them anyway. Wow. So sad. Uh, you can't get anywhere with, with a certain count on a case. That might be the case case here and the, the question is just what can you do to mitigate the overall damage in the bigger picture so that what it may be looking at now of course uh mr kelly your uh, client in the state case is facing decades in prison already for a conviction in new york um kind of play this out this is the similar charges except except on, on, you know, basically that, that he, he bribed the witness in a former trial, you know, he, he subverted justice. And, but it, it's basically similar. The worst crimes are similar to what he's already been convicted of in federal court in New York. Uh, if he were to be found guilty, wouldn't these be served uh, concurrently? Wouldn't they be served at, at, at the same time? You know, what what... What's the that's up to the judge, here? Brad. That's, that's completely up to the judge. In any federal case, the judge has the discretion to make things concurrent or consecutive. Look, on the New York case, he got 30 years. He's going to be 81 or 82 years old. When he gets out of jail, if he has to serve all of that time, maybe he'll be in his late 70s. Uh, I doubt if the 85-year-old judge in this case would pile on to that. Uh, here's a man who has lost everything professionally and everything personally. Uh so yeah, hopefully Lennon Weber has, an, has a heart and hopefully he's not like Ann Donnelly um, that, you know, will prevent this rough justice because a movement, an entire movement is behind a whole man's life. You know, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, as far as the charges, I think the charges here are, are frankly different than the charges there. The charges there were the actual sex acts themselves that were charged. The sex acts aren't charged here. What's charged here is the filming of the sex acts. And it, it's maybe a semantical difference, but it is a difference. Okay, duly noted on those differences. Um, and a another question for you. Uh, you will defend R. Kelly, uh, are continuing to serve as his defense attorney in the state cases. There is a state case here that is ongoing, uh, and there could potentially be a state case that is brought in uh, Minnesota, um, depending a lot on what likely happens in this federal case. Um, I mean, a question for you is, uh, have you had any contact with Mr. Kelly? Uh, does R. Kelly ever believe he will one day be free, exonerated, or not be in a courtroom facing some type of charge or allegation? You know, um, 
he's got very good lawyers. You said they're dogged lawyers. We like to think that we're dogged lawyers and we fight hard for our clients. Uh, Mike Leonard and I, who were on the New York case until some people got him and Robert Taylor, uh, we were absolutely convinced we were going to win that case, in which case he would not be facing 30 years now. Uh, absolutely convinced. Now let's go there. Thank you. If Greenberg had stayed on the case. Do you feel that Robert would have been faced 30 years or would he have been faced with less time? What are your thoughts there? Because he's sitting here saying that if Robert had a went with him, he would not have been, he would not be in this position he's in right now. That sounds like a grand opportunity to, you know, say that he's a good attorney. And so we're going to sit back and watch what he does in his own state uh, trial with him. But wow, that's a lot to say. That's a lot to say. What's your thoughts? I'm convinced that, that we would prevail on the state court cases. I've looked at the evidence. I understand what's involved. I understand the allegations. Um, and as far as the appeal of the New York case, it, it's very interesting because what they did was they took a bunch of small acts that, that weren't really, you know, they were illegal, but they weren't the crime of the century. Uh, usually when you've got a racketeering case, you've got a gang or the mob, and they said the gang has committed seven murders and three kidnappings, and they've been selling kilos of drugs and so on and so forth. With Kelly's case, what they said was, he didn't disclose to somebody he had herpes. That's a misdemeanor. He um, got a fake ID for someone. That's a misdemeanor. They took all these relatively minor things and blew them up into a RICO case, and then the government only asked for 20 years, and the judge gave him 30. Uh, there are a whole host of, and I won't bore everyone with the nitty-gritty, but of good appellate issues on the New York case. And I frankly believe that if the Second Circuit Court of Appeals has any courage, they will do the right thing and they will overturn that verdict and say that this is a gross abuse of the racketeering laws. It's not what was intended. I love that thought because as an appeals perspective individual who's looking at it from the appeal perspective, I would have to truly say that, yes, the way that the rules were used were inconsistent with the way that the law was written. And there are two different, you know, technicalities there. And it's not that, you know, he may get off on the fact that he was 100% innocent more than it will be the technicality behind how the project or the process was, you know, delivered to us as we watched the trial go down. So again, the two questions that I have very, very intimately between us today about Robert Sylvester Kelly is, should he have just served the 2008 uh, trial and lost and got, you know, whatever penalty he was going to get serve it so he would be done for 2022 or would this have come up as an obstruction case, regardless how you have to serve time or not. And number two, if you were on the jury, if you were one of the ones that were selected on the jury, would you find him guilty or not guilty based upon the evidence that was already presented in prosecutorial um, argument? Would you say guilty or not guilty? What, they, what they're doing in a lot of these cases, Brad, if I can pontificate for a minute, is they're, they're going back in time and they're trying to apply 2022 or 2020 outlooks and values to things that happened long ago. Mm -hmm. it, it happened, in, and I know I'll take a lot of heat for this, but it happened to Weinstein, and it happened to Bill Cosby, it's happening to R. Kelly. No, he just told the truth about the criminal justice system. He just said that in America, you have 1994 rules and guidelines that made up social 
respect. If you're a superstar, you're able to have five, 10 girlfriends. You're able to go into court and, and pay your way out of court. You're able to, you know, do things that are immoral. But in 2022, now all of a sudden, America wants to be morally and justly and ethically correct. And because of that, now anything and everything that was done in 94 that still exists for today, they want to cut it off so that they can say that they did what they needed to do in order to justify America. But yet you have people who are still doing heinous things. You still have people being incarcerated at high mass numbers disproportionately. And then you have people who are still human trafficking and the Me Too movement is doing nothing at all right now. Did they stop at R. Kelly's case? Please put that in the chat. What are your beliefs? And I just, you know, I'm going to leave some quiet time, but I want you to still meditate on what I'm saying here. You know, stay focused on what I'm talking about here, but then also uh, make sure that you pay attention to um, what I'm saying as well. We're going to give 10 minutes of empty time in the chat for you to just, you know, think about the questions that we've asked today. I think it's unfair. I think that, that looking at things with hindsight, you know, there was a time when women weren't allowed to vote. There was a time when uh, uh, African-Americans weren't allowed to mingle with white people. We now know that all of that was wrong, but we're not going back and criminally charging people for those kinds of acts. And I understand it's, it's different, but you're, you're going back and you're applying today's values and the way we look at things today to things that happened decades ago when, when not only Kelly looked at it differently, but the alleged victims looked at it differently, their parents looked at it differently, everyone's friends looked at it differently. And, and that's really, you know, this is, this is the greatest hindsight prosecution that I've ever seen. It is noted that uh, many do think there are some... Uh... I so like how Greenberg put that because now of a sudden, you know, in 94, even the parents was cool with it. Even the parents were okay with it. But in 2022, they are turning their viewpoint. I guess people are all grown up now, you know, and people are seeing things the way that they saw them and they just don't want it to be as it is. But Sometimes you just got to wash away the things from the past and let that shit go. Because if you don't let it go, it's going to overwhelm you and overtake you. And then, you know, we're going to be stuck at that age where all that stuff happens. You have to learn. Counseling is the key to get it out, communicate with it, talk to someone who will not use it against you, who will not abuse the information that you share with them and then let it go. Let it go. You know, um, wow. He made some very valid points. What are your views? Uh, appealable issues in the New York case, but you know, you, and I appreciate what, appreciate what you're saying, but it, it's really, uh, you know, unarguable that R. Kelly is seen having sex with a minor that, that he taped. Right. Uh, it doesn't matter how old the video is. I mean, no, 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 that, that, and, and I'm, I'm distinguishing that mm -hmm. from the rest of the case. But the other stuff, the obstruction, they've known about that stuff for years. A See, he's saying, no, don't try to sit here and say that I'm only talking about the case with the videos and all that. And, and the video part is not even an issue anymore. It is what it is. That's what it was. And it is going to just be that. Okay. But. When we're talking about the obstruction, that is where we are in 2022. We're not with even the video. So X that out. Those, I, that's why I don't understand why they even brought the videos to surface. I believe it could be because they brought them to surface to um, maybe just make aware of what was, was happening in 2008. So then that way they could say, well, what are your viewpoints about obstruction? Do you think that this person was really afraid or fearful of their lives or something like that. But to bring that video up or those videos, videos that are lost or 
un, unable to even be noticed. I mean, to even bring that up today is where a lot of people feel double jeopardy tainted the whole prosecutorial evidence um, that was presented. So yeah, so he, so Greenberg is really, really doing good here. There's a very good statute of limitations argument that the defendants have raised that the obstruction was complete when the 2008 trial uh, came back with its verdict. Mm -hmm. And then now to prosecute him for the obstruction violates the statute of limitations. Look, I'm never going to say having sex with a 14 year old is okay. And I think that had they just sought to prosecute him for that, maybe there wouldn't have been a need for a trial. But they're really piling on with this guy, all because of this documentary. And, and what happened in this case was some of the witnesses, in this case, in the New York case, came right out and said, we lied in the documentary. Things weren't what we said in the documentary. So they said, they it's, admitted. It's, it's really a, an unfair okay. prosecution. They admit it under perjury of penalty or not perjury of penalty, immunity. They admitted that they lied on the docuseries. So maybe they already knew that they were going to admit that. And so they said, okay, we're just going to grant you immunity. Just tell us what we need to know. But is that even real? Is it even real? Because if you can lie under penalty of perjury, then you can definitely lie under immunity. What are your thoughts? On many levels. Has he done things wrong? Yes. Did he violate the law? Yes. Should he never have had sex with a 14 year old? Yes. Should he never have filmed it? Yes. Should he be prosecuted for that? Yes. And frankly, he would have been much better off in hindsight had he lost the 2008 trial. Hmm. That's an interesting point. Mm. And, you know, the R. Kelly, his supporters and uh, his defenders, you being his defense attorney, will will say this is definitely a case of piling on federal charges, RICO charges, like you said, in New York. Now, the, the different charges here, federal charges here, then potentially state charges here, then potentially state charges in Minneapolis. Why, why do you think that? And, is? And, and Brad, New York had nothing to do with any of this. If you look at the New York charges, there was one time he had sex with someone in New York uh, who was an adult, but he didn't disclose that he had herpes. That was the connection to New York. Everything else in that case took place. So the appeal is going to more or less say that New York should have only given him a misdemeanor for that situation. But because they wanted to pile on and put more into it to make it worse for him, this is how the Me Too movement and Don, and Don Lee chose to do it. Place in Illinois, California, Florida, New Jersey. I, it had nothing to do with them. Yeah. Once again, Steve Greenberg, our Kelly's defense attorney in the state case. The key question here with all the charges that he's facing, really anyone who's been in the courtroom says it comes down to the videotapes. And videotapes clearly show an older R. Kelly having sex with clearly underage girls. Is there any way the defense is going to be able to lay out a case that overcomes that video evidence? Uh the only way that, that he's getting out of those charges, and he, he was in his 20s at, at, at the time, uh, is uh, if the jurors are, are the world's biggest R. Kelly fans and they just want to cut him a break. I mean, in all honesty, I don't, I don't know there's a way around those charges, <laughs> given the video. Which so he's basically saying he's not going to be able to escape that. However, um, you know, this may be the very reason why he's choosing not to speak at this moment. I'm going to keep it real with you. I mean, make sure you don't say anything that could incriminate incriminate you. So, yeah, keep your mouth shut. You've done so, so far. Let everything else fall the, based on the chips and how they lay. Because you know the mandatory time for holding child pornography on person is five years. That's mandatory sentence. So hopefully, like he said, Lennon Weber will be more um, understanding because of the fact that he's older 
and he's already 85. So to actually grant him a little bit of, you know, support for the situation, um, as well as the jury being, you know, supporters of R. Kelly. We don't know if they're supporters or not. We don't know. Maybe they have grown to be a supporter. Maybe prosecution thought that they were going to be able to infiltrate their thoughts by showing them the negative and all the bad stuff, you know, but Bonjean is there too, to show them the good things as well. So yeah, kind of balanced here. Which I've watched and the testimony that they now have. Um, but the rest of it, he's got a fighting chance and his co-defendants have a, have a fighting chance. Yeah, so you will then when do you come back into the fold? Will you come back into the fold automatically? Or I know the state case is ongoing now, but do you right. expect a decision will be made to go forward or not with the state case, depending on what happens in this, the second federal trial? We were in court this morning on the state case, and the judge raised that very question. I think the answer to that question is, uh, up to Kim Fox and what she wants to do after she sees what happens in the uh, federal trial. Um, we have uh, raised some double jeopardy issues in relation to the state prosecution because some of it is duplicitous with the federal case, uh, but there's four cases. And I believe that what's going to happen is Kim Fox will probably bow out and just allow the federal judge to do with that area of law in the federal case. I don't think she really wants to go opening up the can of worms in Chicago on the state level again. Um, but that's just my opinion. I'm not sure. I don't know if Kim is that type of person that would want to just see him get the whole book thrown at him. I don't know if she's under any form of, you know, um, collaboration or connection to any type of feminist movement or anything like that. I don't know much about her. Um, I did do a little bit of research and found that she herself has some, you know, domestic issues in her own past, in her own recent past. So she should have a understanding, especially being a Chicago state prosecutor or, or Chicago state attorney, that she should validate and value the lifestyle of living in Chicago. I really and truly do. So what are your thoughts there? Cases and they're not all duplicious. So uh, that, that lays at the, uh, at the feet of Kim Fox if, if she wants to go ahead and, and uh, with those cases. Will there be any double jeopardy issues if he is convicted now in the federal case? on what he was exonerated in in 2008 in the state case or is there no, will there, there be no appealable issue there so there there's a um there's a doctrine called the separate sovereign doctrine uh defense attorneys we all hate it the supreme court looked at it a couple of years ago and left it in place the separate sovereign doctrine says that the federal government is a different government than every state government. So it's as if uh, the federal government is, is a different country than, than from the states. You could be prosecuted in state court and prosecuted for the same thing in federal court. That's why you saw Derek Chauvin get, uh, in Minnesota get prosecuted on the, the George Floyd thing. Or they get prosecuted in state court, they get prosecuted in federal court. You've seen that with the Breonna Taylor case in Atlanta, where they get a civil rights. You know, it's a little bit different charge, and the Supreme Court has said as long as there's that little difference, uh, it's permissible. Yeah, you see in a lot of cases now with a, a, a murder charge ex examples in state cases, like you said, and then like the federal hate crime statute. So, so. Mm -hmm. um, Steve Greenberg, we appreciate your insight. We will have you on in the next couple of weeks, friend of the stream. Uh, R. Kelly's defense attorney in the state case now. I've been defending him since 2018. We appreciate you talking with us about the ongoing R. Kelly trial as the defense now begins their case, their presentation, their defense of R. Kelly. 
That's where we're going to leave it off. Um, Bonjean, it's in the hands of Bonjean, Robert, Daryl, Milton, and the, the witnesses that are going to support him and God, you know, that's, that's where we are right now. And, um, so I was told that I had a misleading title to the last video in which I uploaded and it was R. Kelly pleads the fifth. And I said, I was basically, I was basically told that he did not plead the fifth, that what my title was misleading. So I told this woman, it's not a misleading title. It's just misunderstood because there are laws relative to the the definition of the fifth amendment. So what does it really mean to take the fifth? So let me go back here and get the, the, uh, the actual comment because I want you to hear it verbatim. She says, no loved 18 hours ago said your title was misleading because I put R. Kelly tells judge he won't testify at ongoing trial. Um, R. Kelly pleads fifth and defense calls first witness. Okay, so she says, your title is misleading. I said, no, your interpretation of what I'm saying in the title is being misunderstood. And then I go over to the um, Molo Lampkin LLP attorneys at law. And I look at their website on what does it really mean to take the fifth? So the fifth amendment to the U S constitution guarantees no loved that an individual cannot be compelled or coerced or, um, aggressively made by the government to provide incriminating information about himself. So it's called right to remain silent. And it is under the fifth amendment clause. When an individual takes the fifth, they invoke that right and refuses to answer questions or provide information that might incriminate them. We understand how Robert was during the uh, Gail King incident. And in that interview, that's exactly what happened. He became too emotional because of the cross-examination of questioning and the way that the questions were directed to him. So the fifth amendment can be invoked only in these certain situations. An individual can only invoke the fifth amendment in response to a communication that is compelled or controlled, such as through a subpoena or other legal process. Robert is in that legal process right now. So when judge Lennon Weber asked him, do, will you testify? His response was no. He had a response, yes, and the response was no. So, and the communication must also be testimonial in nature. So it must be in a testimonial process. That's why he asked him in the courtroom. In other words, it must relate to either express or implied assertions of fact or belief. So for example, a nod would be considered a testimonial communication for purposes of the Fifth Amendment, so would the act of producing documents or any other piece of evidence. The act of production communicates an implied assertion that the individual possessed the evidence. So the tape is already there. They He doesn't have to say anything. The tape is already there, okay? So whether they want to um, use that as a way for him to say that you figure it out yourself, um, I don't have to prove to you anything here in this trial, in this court, because it's up to the prosecution to, to lay out all of the evidence that they say that I'm responsible for doing. And finally, the testimony must be self-incriminating such that the information would provide a link in the chain of evidence needed to prosecute the individual for a crime. Thus, the information itself need not be incriminating. It suffices that the information would lead to the discovery of incriminating evidence. He doesn't want to go up there and say, you know, something out of emotion that will make people say, aha, 
You know, because everybody's waiting for the aha moment. The aha moment. <laughs> so, so no love. To because the communication must be self-incriminating, an individual who has received immunity cannot invoke the Fifth Amendment as a basis for refusing to answer a question. So it's the opposite. The Fifth Amendment is the opposite to immunity. So if prosecution was told, we're going to grant you immunity, okay? Now you can say whatever you want to say with no worries, with no complaints, um, because the immunity prevents the government from using those statements or any evidence derived from them in a criminal prosecution against the individual. And likewise, an individual who was received a pardon may not have any basis for invoking the Fifth Amendment. Finally, an individual who has been convicted of a crime and sentenced cannot invoke the Fifth Amendment. When an individual takes the fifth, their silence or refusal to answer questions cannot be used against them in a criminal case. So they can't use his silence and say, oh, he's guilty. Mm -mm. Jury can't do that. A, prosecu a prosecutor cannot argue to the jury that the defendant's silence implies guilt and a prosecutor's typical um, response for a witness before the grand jury. If the prosecutor knows the witness will invoke the Fifth Amendment right, it should be stated. But taking the Fifth can have severe consequences. In a civil case or a civil enforcement action, the judge or jury can draw an adverse inference to support liability when the defendant invokes the Fifth Amendment. And an employee who invokes the Fifth Amendment in the response to questions from federal agents who are investigating corporate wrongdoing might be fired as a result. So this is what uh, Greenberg was talking about when he was looking at the difference between white collar, blue collar, and local crime. Okay, so, you know, I just wanted to put that out there because me, myself, personally, I truly feel that I want to give you guys the best information that is absolutely possible and it when someone says that i'm misleading i feel like i need to go and do my research to make sure that it is what it is and for right now i am safe to say it is what it is what are your thoughts on that so we're going to go to our comments and then we're going to head on out today um cindy says god bless robert god bless his lawyers god bless god is working um through this whole entire situation i feel that if they don't have any proof or evidence they should let him go i don't see what's the point of them letting him go in there um he's been there for too long it's like that she says i don't see what's the point of them letting him stay in there this long like that's not right but i believe justice is going to be served the devil can't win and he's not going to win in the name of jesus in the name of jesus so i want to say to robert stay strong and keep your head up keep your faith i'm going to always have faith that robert is going to be a free man in the hands of god and hope and believe he is in my prayers every day in my heart karma is nothing to play with when they are doing this to him and railroading him in the name of Jesus, I believe it's going to end soon. So Robert can have a peace of mind and joy in his heart. I want to say God bless Robert. God bless his lawyers. God bless his children. Amen. And I say amen. Uh, James Blackburn. Oh, Frankie and Johnny. I, just, I do apologize. Yesterday it was a premiere. And I saw you come on. I did uh, put something in the chat for you, but you didn't hear me. It's not that I overlooked you. It's I wasn't able to be personal with you because it was an already pre-recorded video. So I know you were there and I'm so glad to see you guys back. Thank you so much. And all prayers are going up for Robert. Um, James says, let's go Bonjean, exploit these thirsty people. Too many lies, it, it seems like his whole team was out to get him. Major, major haters, and they were all eating. And he says, shaking my head. <laughs> Jimmy in the house, a.k.a. Chipper. Chirp, master chirp. <laughs> Michelle, they talking 20 to, 40, 20 to 24 years ago. 
What in the world are these people thinking about? Why is anything that long ago even being entertained right now? What has America come to? America has come to, Michelle, that opportunist opportunity. Um, anything, well, you know, everybody that was around him was already taking advantage of the opportunist perspective anyway. And then that's why I believe that it could have been very, very easily for somebody to blackmail him as far as, you know, telling him that if he don't do this, they're going to do that and whatever. But again, time will tell everything. So I'm going to put about 10 to 15 minutes in the chat. I want you to think about the two questions that I asked earlier um, on this podcast. And it is, you are the jury on the, um, you're one of the jurors on the stand watching this go down based upon what the prosecution has stated in their, in their argument. Do you feel that he, that Robert is guilty or innocent of obstructing justice, not of the sex on the tape, but of obstructing justice? Do you believe that these people were in fear of their lives? And that was the reason why they were gone to the Bahamas. Or do you feel that you know, individuals were just enjoying and entertaining themselves and not really caring about morality until it got down to the nitty gritty in 2022. What are your views? Number two, would Robert have been more well off having served time in 2008 for this case, keeping everything else under seal, including all the information that came out in 2022 and just served his time, done it and came out and, you know, could that, would he have been better off or is it better for him to have been in the position he's in right now, going after appeal, going after, you know, um, pleading the fifth and speaking, you know, from silence. So those are the views in which we are holding today at our Kelly Appeal TV. I thank you so much for liking, commenting, and subscribing to this podcast. And I thank you for all the views. I didn't go over the live because everything was somewhat similar. So I think I've probably already done the live um, comments. So I will be looking for you to comment on this one for Tuesday. We don't really have much else to report. I just wanted to get this out the way because I feel Greenberg's um, interjection of what he feels about the trial is very important based on getting us ready for if he needs to go back to Greenberg in order to hit that state level with Kim Fox and all of that. So (laughs) it's a lot. And, but we're in it to win it. And we're loyal here at our Kelly Appeal TV. So he has Kelly Nation supporters that are here that is going to really, really be down for him until the very, very, very end and beyond, you know? So again, um, I thank you so much for being here September 2nd, 2022. God bless you all. And as always, keep it 100 and we'll see you next time.